So first things first, thank you very much. Uh, I know it's 10, 10 a.m. in the morning, uh, Friday the 13th, and you are here you know, to talk about Hestrix and Lacinia in production. Uh, so my name is Tiago Lucini. You see my, my handle there. Maybe we start even there, like saying hi. You know, I'm Tiago Lucini. Um, I'm partner in technology for a company called Working Company. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit more about that uh, in quite a bit. But just before we, we dive into, in, into the content, I, I, I want to present myself a little bit better with something that is not related at all with, uh, with technology or, or development. So if you, throughout this 30 minutes, 40 minutes, we're going to be talking uh, here, uh, you find my accent a little bit weird. Here's the reason. So during the last 12, 13 years, I have been all over the place. I have been you know, moving. Uh, following the money, following uh, different projects, different interesting things and research. And uh, if you really want a more accurate depiction of that, because this is, this is cool, right? This is, uh, this is our designer friends would love it because like, it looks pure, just the flags. But the dependency diagram is like this. <laughs> and uh, that probably explains that the dotted lines there is because my first name is Portuguese, my last name is Italian. I was born in Brazil, and then I kept moving back and forth, like on these places. So this is going to be relevant in quite a bit. Um, something else that, uh, that I want to be very open about is that uh, when I'm not coding, when I'm not uh, uh, working, I'm doing this. I'm a distance runner. Uh, and what it means in practice is, like for instance, this race last year was a 60K. Uh, so, you know, it's 50 miles, uh, 100 miles, I'm preparing for a 200 mile next year. And uh, this is a, not, not such a big room, but if you, got, if you in the back cannot recognize me, I'm not the hot looking one on the left. I'm the one looking rather um, intent on the right side. And overly equipped, of course, we are engineers, so I have to carry all, all sorts of tech with me, of course. Um, so during the last four years, I've been working with, uh, with a bunch of friends. Uh, in a company called Working Company. Um, uh, so we are around 230 people now. Uh, we have offices in six different places. Uh, we are kind of a global company. And the kind of stuff that we do is that uh, we design and develop products that uh, people use every day. So what kind of products? And uh, so I, I compiled here a very brief list of uh, some of our clients. So you probably have used some of our products before. They are digital products that we interact from a uh, either an app perspective or an embedded perspective or, or, uh, or even web. So cool. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, I want to hear a little bit about you guys not, not, so that we can continue. So I don't know how many of you have heard, worked, or anything about Lacinia. So show of hands, who has any? So that's cool. I can actually probably summarize things a little bit. Anyone has used GraphQL in something else, like JavaScript? Shame on you guys. <laughs> so what about Hystrix? Who has used, played with Hystrix? Cool. Any other circuit breaker out there? Anyone using another circuit breaker? Cool. I want to talk to you later. <laughs> Anyone try to combine Lacina and Hystrix together? Awesome. So we're going to get to the conclusion very quickly. So just for those of you who ha don't know what Lacinia is, uh, very quick primer. So Lacinia is, uh, is an implementation from, uh, sponsored by Walmart Labs um, of the GraphQL uh, interface. GraphQL is Facebook's uh, query language for APIs. We're going to have a little bit of a primer of what that means uh, uh, before we dive deeper into it. But in a nutshell, Lacinia really helps you provide this kind of uh, API interface. And it's super fast. Uh, what's Hystrix? Hystrix uh, is a secret, secret breaker implementation. It's a, it's a very interesting architecture that has helped us a lot in quite many uh, resilient applications. We're also going to go a little bit deeper into what is a circuit breaker, what it, uh, uh, what it means in practice, and why both are interesting together. But just keep that in mind. Uh, Netflix has been using it. It's sponsored and maintained by Netflix. Uh, it's super cool. So why both of them together? And uh, I truly hope that we can answer that at the end of this presentation. So, but uh, from our experience, uh, we have been using either Lacinia in isolation or Hystrix in isolation. And uh, when we start combining them, we were like, wow, we have a very interesting, super powerful combination here. 
So you know, by the power of composition and, and getting the best of, uh, of, uh, of every single world, we got to a very interesting and solid architecture that we want to share. So let's just start with a very uh, a simple example. And then uh, uh, I want to use here even a, a, a case that you guys would eventually recognize, because it's an e-commerce website. Uh, All the shoes is, is one of our clients. They came to us uh, a few a few few uh, uh, months ago with this mission of uh, renovating the whole website, the whole digital experience. Uh, and it's a it's an e-commerce. Uh, here, this is the future uh, selection page, the, the product selection page. You have different filters, different categories, and uh, it's what you would expect on on an e-commerce website, right? You have products, prices, images, filters, categories. Uh, so let's say that, for instance, we are tasked, we're going to build here a, a, a simple uh, example uh, using this kind of domain. So I, I'm a little bit old school, so I, I like starting um, uh, my uh, implementations by seeing the, the model, at least the schema, and how things relate to each other. Uh, so I quickly designed here a very simple model on how, a very simple schema on how this would work. Uh, of course, you see lots of relationship lines there, and that's because even something as simple as just like relating products and categories might be a little bit more advanced. I uh, created uh, several different ways of relationship between these guys just to extrapolate the model a little bit. So a product has categories, but a category has parent categories and also children categories. And we also have breadcrumbs because I want to be able to actually see the whole path to get to a certain product. So I kind of extrapolated a little bit so that this wouldn't be a super boring example. Uh, and I also wanted to show a little bit some of the power that we have in our hands. Uh, but as I said, this, this is me, right? Uh, this looks a little bit like UML, uh, but it's not. Uh, it's kind of a UML-like notation. Uh, we used uh, Grapis to, to render this, and, uh, and we, I'm going to get to more details about this in a bit. But uh, if you don't want to see it this way, of course, let's get to some closure Eden here so that uh, we feel more at home. So it's the same stuff, right? Like this uh, uh, that initial diagram just renders into this uh, Eden file. This is the way that Lacinia actually understands it. Lacinia needs a file like this to bootstrap. Uh, the reason why you know, I, I have that beautiful diagram is that as part of our tooling internally, uh, we have this neutral schema uh, language that we define called umlaut. Uh, we have a, a beautiful InstaParse tool that just uh, generates uh, all sorts of schemas for us. Uh, we just right, we, we don't like repeating ourselves as m most lazy developers, and uh, the good ones are all the lazy ones. So we just write it once, and then we have generators for Lacini schema, for Graphis, for Closure Spec, because of course we want everything validated, uh, and even for those crazy people that want to do GraphQL in JavaScript, we just export for them, and, uh, and good luck. So going back to my schema, that's my schema for something very simple. And the way that Lacino works is that uh, you combine uh, a schema definition with a bunch of resolvers. And th those resolvers all have the same uh, signature. They all receive a context, a, a, a bunch of arguments, which is a map, and the value that is being created. So these resolvers are being called uh, recursively to build the output that you want. You wrap these guys up into this box called Lacina, which is a Lacina executor. Uh, you wrap Lacina up into a, an HTTP, pedestal, ring, you name it. And then what you have is something super cute, which is you send GraphQL queries uh, to your API, and you get JSON responses on the other side. What does this mean in practice? This means, uh, you know, this would be a very simple GraphQL query for this domain. I just want the name of all the products. Uh, and then you get a response like this in my in memory, very overly simpl simplified database for this domain. So showing that on code, uh, this is the way that I'm actually just loading up my Lacine schema. Of course, you see the magic here is just a thread macro, very simple thread macro. Uh, the first three lines are just like creating the schema because I'm creating out of my, my umlaut definition file. Uh, I attach a bunch of resolvers, which are just a bunch of functions that I have in a different domain, uh, in a different namespace, and then I compile this schema, and I have a, a, a almost ready Lacina uh, 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 system in place. Of course, I have to weave it up a little bit with my HTTP server separately, but that's out of the scope of this conversation. Uh, but this is interesting. This is, uh, this is that probably the, the next uh, interesting part of Lacina implement, uh, a Lacina implementation your resolver. 
Of course, for something like this, super simple, I only have two resolvers. This is my product resolver, right? So uh, you don't have to worry too much about all the parameters I'm passing around, but what it's, it's doing in practice is uh, querying a database. So it just queries a database. It can actually do a, a little bit of transformation if that's the case, uh, and exposes that back to my, uh, to my consumer, right? One cool thing about uh, the GraphQL uh, uh, ecosystem, if you will, is a thing called a graphical, uh, or you know, we didn't know how to pronounce it initially when we were like graph IQL, they put an I there and they call it graphical for some reason. It's a React application. Uh, Lacina has it by default, you just send a true and it will create an instance of it for you when you, so when you bump it up. Um, and what it does is that it allows you to interactively check and interactively uh, deal with your data model and with your, uh, with your queries. And uh, I'm gonna show here a very simple example. So what I'm doing here is that, uh, you know, you can see on the right hand side, I have all the documentation. I can explore my model in, in further detail. Uh, and I can also, with autocomplete on the la left hand side, I can just create the queries I want. So something super simple as, I want the name and the images, play, there you go, I have the name and the images in my database. If I want to extend a little bit, for instance, I want to know the category of each one of the products, I refer to the, the other resolver, category name, I have the name of those guys, great. Uh, can go a little bit deeper, for instance, rem remember I told you I had breadcrumbs, so I want to see the breadcrumbs of all these products, so all the categories to get to that product, great, easy as hell. And because these models are self-referential, um, my categories also have products, so I can even go deeper into my categories and get the products of those categories. This is another interesting tool uh, um, of, of GraphQL. You can create aliases. So I also created a tiny little filter by ID uh, on my products endpoint, and I'm saying, give me the product that has the, uh, by, uh, the ID BAR, and I call it prod1, and then call it prod2 for my ID SDE. And uh, I want the name and the image of each one of these guys, name and image, play, and there you go. You have those two, right? So this is a super quick primer just to tell you that we're giving a lot of power to the front end when we do something like this, because the front end can kind of change and evolve in tiny little ways uh, that make it super easy for, for, for us to accept change at the end of the day. But I want to talk a little bit about something even deeper, like uh, things change drastically in production, especially when things are already out there, uh, out live. And this is a very dear subject to my heart because uh, you know, I moved a lot. And what I noticed in my, my native uh, language when I was preparing this is that uh, in, in Portuguese, my na native language, the word move and change, they are the same. I had never noticed that. And then I quickly checked on the dictionary and I realized that move in English actually says advance or progress. It's one of the meanings, right? So we're always moving forward and trying to advance. And uh, people kind of hate change you know, every now and again, but it's one of the only ways to progress. I really love that. Uh, let's, let's change something a little bit deeper into this thing. You saw this payload uh, over there uh, when we were querying it. and uh, you, I don't know if you noticed, but the images were quite big. We were talking about 3,200 uh, uh, by 3,200 images. They are huge. So as you probably know out there, uh, when we have a situation like this, uh, our users will want, our front end users, they will want something a little bit more adaptive. They want images you know, for the size of their devices, for the size of their wearables, and 3,200 is a little bit too big. You don't want to send such a big uh, image anyway. So let's make that happen. Let's make that change, right? Uh, let's start with the initial model that we had, and I'm going to extend it, you know, by magic, zooming in very quickly, and you probably noticed that uh, I kept the old image uh, uh, over there, because I don't want to break any app, anything that is using that image. I'm creating something that I call image object. Uh, I created a separate schema called image that encapsulates a little bit more data. Uh, in this case, the URL and the width and the height of the image that I'm sending back. And I also added two parameters, uh, two arguments to this node that I called the width and the height of the image I'm, uh, I'm, I'm trying to fetch from the database uh, or from any system in between in this case. So how do I build a resolver? I had to create a resolver specifically for images and this is it. Uh, and Oops, that's too much. 
So I create a resolver just for it, and you can see on this resolver that I have the width and the height. I'm getting this width and height from the arguments. I set a default with uh, the 3200 just to keep the sim similar behavior. And then I have some magic. Of course, I, I hit that, that magic in a, in a separate namespace here in a function called parse image params that, that goes through these things and calculates what the size of the image should be, you know, fetches it from a, from a, 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 a local storage or remote storage or do whatever, uh, or even does the, the dynamic resizing if that need, if need be, but it's hidden somewhere. So let's see that in action. You see those, those arguments there? Uh, the parameters, as I said, my magical function, and then let's see this in practice. Let's see this in graphical. So in graphical, and of course, as you would expect, of course, it has updated the, the right-hand side. You can see the two different images there. I can see more details. This is great for your users on the other side of this API because uh, they don't need to actually go into Swagger or anything like this. They can just like browse and explore your API you know, as, as they go. So I'm gonna just do a query where I ask for the image object and you see the basic uh, uh, image there. I copy and paste this image. I just wanna make sure that it's the wrong and big one. It should be a gigantic image. It took even a while to, to refresh. There you go, it's super big. So imagine if you were in a mobile device, you don't want that, that huge picture. You want something smaller. You want something like you know, 10 times smaller and I get a different URL for a different asset. Uh, this asset on this example is uh, statically rendered, but, uh, but in some of our cases, uh, we dynamically render these assets as well, just in case, and then we cache them. But there you go, this is a much smaller image, super easy. And uh, of course, you can change any kind of resolution you want. Uh, and one good thing is that because you are combining the resolvers and building on top of the resolvers you already had, I still retain uh, the other resolver that I already had, the by ID. So I can still combine and I uh, don't really change uh, much from the, from the client perspective. So what this means in practice is that uh, for our production environments, let's see, implementing something like, like Lacinia and by using tooling like, like Umlaut, for instance, uh, we can change fast, we can change super fast. But in production, there is something else that happens. You know, things go wrong, uh, and they go wrong very, very often. And uh, this is also something else that is very dear to heart to me. Uh, so this is me uh, in, a, in a very desperate position uh, in my last attempt to run uh, 100 miles nonstop. Uh, this was probably around our 16, I don't know. I know I stopped counting at that point. Uh, things were going badly. Things were failing. Uh, uh, it doesn't really show in the picture, but I, I had almost fell on a cliff and uh, my, my leg was bleeding. Uh, and it was 16 hours. I was tired and, uh, and I was, it was depleted of energy. And the funny thing is, and I even have a video, uh, I, you know, I prepare for everything. You know, there is a, that uh, orange folder you see in one of the shots there. Uh, it's a 40-page document that describes how to even change the battery of my watch if it fails. Uh, because, you know, I've been doing this for four years and I know I'm kind of prepared for everything that can happen, but things still go wrong every single time that I try something like this. So one thing that I learned uh, with, uh, with, this, uh, with the Navy SEALs is that they say this all the time, embrace the suck. And what it means in practice is the situation is bad, just, just deal with it. Just like deal with the situation. And I love the fact that the situation is bad, period. I, I, no, I really want to emphasize that. It, it is bad, period. Uh, do we in the tech space as engineers deal with the bad stuff? And I, I want to tell a little bit of an anecdote for the next slide. Uh, this is, uh, and I'm paraphrasing the next slide because uh, uh, it's, a, it's a project we're actually running currently. And uh, we are running as a client side, we have an app, and uh, it's super slow. When we hit the back end, the back end is so slow that it times out, and it times out over and over again. So we asked our, our, our friend engineers on the other side, guys, please have a look at it, you know, what's happening? And this is what they wrote to us. So great, you know, they found the source of all evil. 
the source of all evil is that there's more evil, like stuff breaks. And uh, it's okay, right? Like uh, it's, uh, we are all engineers, we're all friends, we understand that this is, this, this is the way it is. But I didn't show you the whole message because uh, for me the conclusion was a problem. So it's correct. <laughs> there is nothing we can do, you know, the shrug, uh, the shrug in, in meme, and, and that's it. Like, oh, there's nothing we can do. It, it breaks all the time. And I, I, I don't like that, right? Like, I think that maybe because of my running, uh, stuff happens, we prepare, and when it's bad, we fix it again, and we keep fixing, and we keep making it better, especially for production. Why this happens, and I have a theory. This, this happens because uh, uh, we believe in the happy path. And the happy path here is like, we have a user, the user hits our server, it's our HTTP server, the, and then we have like all these dependencies and everything is green, everything is, is happy, there's nothing goes wrong, we have these external dependencies. You know, here, artistically, you know, one could be a database, another one is an external server, a web server, some soap shit you have to do. Uh, but our HTTP there is basically sitting and doing this orchestration and everything is fine. Uh, but what happens when one thing goes wrong? So same diagram, same user, you know, we hit a, a, our web server, uh, but one guy there is either sl slightly slower or just like problematic for some reason. And very quickly, if you have a, a, a constant rate of requests, let's say 50 requests a second hitting the server, uh, all the threads of the, of the HTTP server can be blocked super, super fast. You know, it's what I call like tiny problems, big repercussions. Like it can really scale super quickly. So using our example, uh, you know, I since everything is in memory and it was closure, closure is super easy. Um, I implemented a simple latency simulator. So uh, my simulation here is like let's say that our products and categories and whatnot they are in a database. I have to get the data from that database. But I have a tiny latency there that uh, runs an average of 100 milliseconds, you know, oscillates a little bit, has 100 milliseconds of uh, standard deviation. Uh, and let's see what, what happens, you know, let's run some, uh, some load on this server. And this is the latency diagram that I got. And then if you're not used to a latency, latency diagram, a very quick primer here, right? So what this means in practice is that 99.9% uh, uh, .9 of our requests uh, to this server they, they get a response within 500 milliseconds, right? 493 or whatever. Uh, but if you calculate this based on your, your usage behavior, uh, you might get something like this, that you know, around 6% of your users are seeing at least one request that takes 500 milliseconds. So even with something as tiny as a 100 millisecond there, uh, it can scale all the way up to 500, the failure point. Uh, Cool, beautiful numbers. You know what this means for me, and I'm, uh, uh, you know, sometimes I'm, I, I try to wear the hat of a business guy. This is money on the table, because if my users leave my website uh, because they are expecting a response in 200 milliseconds, and I have six percent of my users hitting it at, at, at 500 milliseconds, I'm losing money. Like my users are not really; they're just going to a competitor, right? So this is bad already. But I kept like moving forward. So. I, I tried to simulate something else here. I tried to simulate, well, what if my products are coming from a query and my, product, my products are coming from one and categories are coming from another one, so I have two dependencies or I have like whatever, a web server for one and uh, a database for the other one or two queries. It doesn't matter, two dependencies. And uh, they, they follow the same uh, standard deviation, right? The same 100 and 100 for, for both. And I simulated the very same load once again. And I put them side by side not surprisingly, it doubles, right? Again, this means like almost a second for 6% for, for of our users. Great, now let's simulate that one tiny problem happens. And this is tiny, right? Well, this one database sometimes takes two seconds, sometimes takes zero, sometimes takes one, sometimes takes four, we don't know. It's just like slow because there is a kind of problem in the network or in the infrastructure, but I'm simulating that here by like bumping it up to a two second uh, uh, average and two second uh, uh, standard deviation. And this is the very same load and uh, you're gonna be surprised. It goes up super fast. And then I'm zooming in very quickly here because uh, this scale is completely out of proportion, right? We were talking about a minute and a half, almost two minutes for some users. A minute and a half.
it was super quick, in my opinion. And just to put that in perspective, like uh, the blue line there was our worst case scenario before, right? So this is so out of proportion that, uh, that uh, it's, it's unfathomable. And put, to put some numbers, because 100% uh, of our users saw 20,000 milliseconds, 20 seconds. 70% of our requests were lost, and the server performance actually is lower, you know, was five times lower. So it's like completely out of, uh, out of uh, uh, I cannot even think of something like this. And then if you can't as well, and you think that uh, your servers are perfect, uh, uh, I, there is a little bit of a support of mine, because I keep going through the front end code uh, of, our, of our projects or open source projects, and I look for stuff like this, and I'm zooming in. Have you guys ever seen this? I've seen this so many times, and I love when it happens like this. The, the, the default timeout is one second, and then they bump it up to, to two, and then five, and then 10, and then 60. This one is gonna be 120 quite soon, right? <laughs> it does happen, it does happen. So if you, don't, if you doubt me, just go ahead and try. So let's welcome Circuit Breaker. So if you haven't seen an, a, a Circuit Breaker, a physical one, that's how it looks. So this is a circuit breaker for you, our electricity, for our electrical installations. And what it does is that it protects uh, uh, the tree of, uh, uh, within the grid, right? So if there is a short circuit in your apartment, your unit, you don't want that short circuit short circuit your neighbor or the whole building. And so you have this tree of circuit breakers that keep like protecting it, increasing, increasingly more powerful and, and uh, uh, you know, bigger chunks of electricity. So what it means in practice for, for us on a software perspective is, uh, is something like this. The same diagram I had before, the user hits uh, the HTTP server, but instead of hitting directly the dependency, you have a circuit breaker in between, and in this case, we're gonna be talking about Hystrix, and if there is something that, that is wrong down, down there in the dependency, the circuit breaker notices that and controls the, 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 the feedback loop all the way up to the, to the consuming side, right? What it means in practice? Let's see that on the code level. So here I imported Hystrix. So you have two ways of using Hystrix. You can import it directly, it's implemented in Java. So it, of course we are in the Java ecosystem, we can do whatever we want. Uh, but I'm using their official um, uh, wrapper uh, uh, that, that is part of the package. It's super, super well designed. Uh, and this is it. It provides a dev command um, macro. So what the dev command does, it's a very similar signature as the devn macro. Um, and as you can see, I just created a dev command uh, called fetch products that uses the same uh, um, uh, signature that I already had elsewhere and kind of isolates, just wraps my, in my external dependency. Uh, and you see it down there, what I call it, that I'm instead of calling the query directly, now I just call fetch products. Uh, and the magic that is happening when I do this kind of stuff is that now Hystrix is controlling this one. There is a command pat pattern around this function called fetch product that controls the quality of this dependency. So you can you have a lot of configuration, you can, you can fine tune any way you want this one specific integration point, but by doing just this, it means that the very basics taking place. For instance, uh, if there is a one millisecond, 1,000 millisecond uh, delay or, or timeout, you will immediately say, well, there's something wrong with that dependency, let me open the, the, the circuit breaker and let me stop, like people are not gonna be able to actually reach this, this guy anymore. I'm gonna error out before trying it again. And then every now and again, I just try it once again, see if the, it's healthy now. If it's healthy, I close the circuit and everything is back, back on live. Uh, if you just do like this, your product's gonna be much better. Your, your, input, uh, your server is gonna actually act much better. Uh, one practice that we have is that uh, for every single external dependency, we even wrap them in a map called external dependency. Every time you need to actually use any one of those, wrap it up on a, on a, on a dev command because uh, that's gonna make your product better. Uh, so this is, this is more than enough, but I want to show you something else. I added this one line here. Uh, it's part of the macro. It's a, it's a map uh, where you can subscribe, you can send lots of um, uh, configuration to Hystrix, but one of the things that I really love is the fallback strategy. It's a, it's a function uh, with the same signature as your incoming function, uh, and this is like, when stuff goes wrong, what do I do? So in this case, what I'm telling Hystrix is, if 
your dependency fails, you cannot hit, hit it, reach the database for some reason, just return with, a, with an empty vector. Just return something, right? This is called a, a fail silent strategy. We, I'm going to go a little bit deeper into that soon. But I, I, I run the same performance load over it and completely different curve. And what's beautiful about this curve is that anything below one second is super fast because it flattened out. Above one second, it means, well, this is your protection. This is where your, your secret breaker is being triggered. And just like in comparison, this was like the two dependency approach that we had before. So even for a, a very simple example like this, it already made it much faster. And, and, and that one and the, and the one with the bump is the one where it's acting up. The one of the dependencies is actually broken. So that's super cool. So you might be saying, well, but sending an empty vector is kind of dumb. And I'm, I agree, it's dumb. Uh, so there are a few different strategies for fallback. Uh, two simple ones. Um, uh, one is fail fast, just like you know, fail and send an error message to the client, like I can't, I can't do this now, there's a problem. Fail silently, just send a nail, a true or false or an empty vector like I did. Um, there are more advanced things like send, uh, send a static content because uh, you, you know that 90% of people need this static content, so let's send this, this stuff. Stubbed content, like uh, infer what the response could potentially be out of a parameter. That's, uh, that's something interesting. The one that I really like is the cached one, just like hit the main cache or some kind of memory cache that you had before or a similar qu query and then send it back. And you can also do very advanced stuff like chaining fallbacks. The same way you can, you can connect several circuit breakers physically one after another, you can also do that with, uh, with fallback strategy. You can have like a def command that calls another def command that calls another one and they have different strategies. So if the first fails, the next one uh, actually works, the next one uh, does and, and so far and so on. So where we get here is that Hystrix is, uh, allows us to fail fast and this is super important for production. So just as a wrap up, I want, to, I want you guys to have like seven takeaways out of this whole thing. So first is, in production you have to embrace change. Some stuff will change and you have to embrace it. Don't, don't, don't stay there saying like, well, this is gonna take a while. We have to be as fast as possible to embrace change. Second, uh, with something like Hystrix and Circuit Breakers, you can embrace failure. Stuff will break, will fail just accept it, just like embrace the suck, like the, the CEO say. Uh, a third point is GraphQL is just part of the equation, right? It's not the whole thing. And people complain a lot about GraphQL and with reason because of two big problems. They say, well, resolvers may get too complex. And every now and again they do. So what you do, is easy. If you put a hysterix here, you can externalize some of this complexity to an, even an external service. Call it a microservice if you like it, and voila, your resolver is much simpler. Uh, people complain as well that in GraphQL there is no browser cache because each query is unique and you use post to get the query, and they're right. You don't really get a, a you don't really maximize the cache on the browser side. Great, uh, by using something like main cache D, connect it directly with your Hystrix, and just lower your, 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 uh, 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 your configuration on Hystrix, for instance, for, for, uh, for giving up and, and triggering the fallback, and you're gonna get a cache that actually hits 50% uh, of the time, 60%, you can make the math. So my conclusion here is, my takeaway is, secret breakers, uh, they cover the shortcomings that you normally have in GraphQL, so combining both is actually super powerful. There's one thing that uh, initially was part of this, uh, of this demo, but uh, I didn't have time to put together for you guys, and we wouldn't have time to actually cover it, is the, ha the Hystrix dashboard. Uh, it comes for free, like uh, it's already part of the package. Uh, this is a dashboard so showing every single dependency, every single function you have, uh, how healthy or how unhealthy it's behaving along the time and in real time. Uh, if you have a cluster, this is interesting, this is showing like 500, 581 nodes running within a cluster uh, and it collects data from all of these guys. We have been putting these things together and they are so useful. Now, we have DevOps people just looking at this and being able to say system X is failing, function Y is taking too long and I truly recommend it. So my, my fourth takeaway here is like, Mon you're going to be able to monitor at the function level. So the more dev commands you have, the more your ability to actually have something like this. Fifth one is, uh, is what we call the consumer-driven mindset. Uh, by 
the money is the one carrying the money. That's uh, the, sorry, the uh, user is the one carrying the money. That's what I meant with this picture, right? So user knows what the user wants. Um, uh, referring to, to what Rich, and, and, uh, Rich said yesterday, you know, the user doesn't really care if we're using types, if we're using X, if we're using Y. They care if this stuff works, right? So, and they have the money. And then every now and again, we have users coming with money and saying, like, I just want this done. And we have to be the ones saying, this can be done. And when we are the ones saying, this can't be done, it's, it's, it's a little bit annoying because we are leaving money on the table. So the value starts uh, at the consuming side, and let's highlight that when we, when we do solutions. Uh, sixth one, uh, you know, even though we talked a lot about performance uh, with Hystrix, um, it's not about early optimization, right? Uh, don't really consider this a performance issue. It's not. It's all about failure first. Just accept the fact that it's going to fail. Uh, uh, performance can come later, right? You know, performance will come just by, by, by fine-tuning your, your Hystrix configuration. So the takeaway for me is you're forcing yourself to think about fallback. Every time you know something will fail, think about a fallback. And then last but not least, um, we talk a lot about production issues, right? So we talk a lot about production issues, um, but when we see a product, we see features and production issues that kind of overlap together. And I really like the whole idea of uh, what is called the whole product that uh, when we are building products for, for end users and for consumers, we are thinking about everything. We are thinking about how it's going to break, how it's going to make people happy, what's going to be the value delivered to users. So my seventh takeaway here is uh, think in terms of, uh, of the whole product. Don't really just focus on, on one tiny little thing. Thank you very much. So we might have time for one question or two. One at a time. Do uh, circuit breakers introduce latency? Uh, the question is, do circuit breakers introduce latency? Uh, and the answer is, uh, it, they may, they may. Like uh, in, in some of these tests, uh, that, uh, when we do those tests, we can see a little bit of a bump, especially at the upper end. Uh, when uh, it's doing its own thread management. So it, it does introduce a little bit, but not on the lower end. Sure. It already is. Actually, actually uh, if you check on my website and you follow the links for this presentation, uh, or even for the open source projects we have, it's already open source. So one more? Sure. Uh, so the question is how sophisticated Hystrix is, and uh, especially when you have multiple fallbacks or you don't want fallbacks. Or, and I have to say, uh, we've been using it for almost a year already, and we haven't explored everything. It's huge. Uh, it's huge, huge, huge. The only thing that I say is uh, every now and again, the, the wrapper, the closure wrapper, doesn't, doesn't cut it, and we have to go to Java. We have to fall back into just uh, doing basic interop. Uh, but it's super powerful. It allows like the creation of contexts, and then you can do some memoization within the same session. Uh, it's super flexible in terms of like multiple fallback strategies or uh, uh, um, what else that we have done before, because that covers a lot. Oh yeah, even a threading pro uh, because it's multi-threaded, so you can also like control the threading system. Uh, that every, so if you really know what you're doing at the at the JVM level, at the bare metal level, you can optimize a lot. Like, then I'm not even the expert anymore at that point. Cool. Thank you very much, guys.